The ongoing debate over climate change has a lot of environmental groups calling for a decrease in global population in order to save the planet. Joining me now via Skype from Memphis, Tennessee, is Dr. Calvin Beisner, national spokesperson for the Cornwall Alliance. It's a group made up of natural scientists, economists, and theologians. And he's also author of the book, Prospects for Growth, A Biblical View of Population Resources and the Future. Dr. Beisner, welcome back to BCN. Great. Thanks very much. Good to be back with you. Now, it's interesting that Prince Harry recently announced in an interview that he's only having a maximum of two children out of concern for the environment. Can you explain why there's such a fear right now of overpopulation? Well, uh, at the moment, the fear seems to be connected primarily with fears of dangerous man-made global warming. And if global warming is man-made and dangerous, uh, obviously, the more people there are, the more of it you're going to get, right? Uh, but of course, the fears of overpopulation are not by any means new. They go back not just a couple centuries, but thousands of years. Wow, tell me more about that. Well, you can start, for instance, with Abraham and Lot in the book of Genesis, who were concerned because they didn't think that the land on which they lived could support both their families and their livestock. So they decided, we'll, we'll separate. Abraham told Lot, you, you look to whatever direction you want, whichever way you go, you can have that land, I'll take what's left. Lot chose the most fertile land. Abraham accepted what was, what was left, not nearly so fertile, indicating that Abraham was really living by faith and Lot by fear. Uh, but today, of course, that very same land supports thousands of times uh, as many people as Abraham and Lot and their families were. And the reason is that people can transform their environments and make those environments capable of supporting far more people than a lot of folks understand. Well, here we are in the 21st century, so let me ask you, are we simply running out of resources? Absolutely not. And the best way to know that is simply by tracking resource prices. You see, price is a measurement of scarcity. And as prices rise, they tell us that scarcity is increasing. As they fall, they tell us that scarcity is decreasing. Well, it happens to be the case that the long-term trend of the price of every single resource that we extract out of the earth, whether it's minerals or plants or animals, the long-term price trend is downward, which means that they're becoming less scarce over time, not more scarce. There is, however, one exception to that. That's people. Even though we have more and more people, their price is going up. Wages are rising, adjusted for inflation over the long haul, whereas the price of everything else is falling, adjusted for inflation over the long haul, uh, and especially adjusted for wages, indexed against wages. So people, even while there are more and more of us, are getting more scarce, and everything else, even though there might be less and less of it, is getting less scarce, and that's because people are really good at making more and more out of less and less, finding new sources of different minerals and the like, and finding new ways to use them more efficiently. So if it's okay to have more than two children, how do we change that mindset with a lot of people in society today? That is a really great question, because as far as demographers are able to, to track, it appears to be absolutely without exception, the case that as people become wealthier, as their societies move from, say, an agrarian society to early industrialization, to later industrialization, to a highly technical society, people choose to have fewer and fewer children. And it's fairly easy to understand why. Uh, in, in an agrarian society, a child becomes a net producer by about the age five or six. In a high-tech society, most children don't become net producers. They continue to be net dependents on their parents until their late 20s, their early 30s. And more and more people say, well, why do I want to have four or five or six children when I'm going to have to pay for them for 30 years? Uh, the only thing it seems to me that's going to change that thinking is a major change in the whole understanding of 
the value of persons, of the value of human beings. And frankly, Christians taking seriously what God tells us in Psalm 127, children are a gift from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward, not his punishment. Like arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are children in the days of one's youth. Happy is the man whose quiver is full of them. We really need Christian revival to reverse the trend that has it such that it's, it's fairly sensible, fairly plausible, that by the year 2300, total global population could be as little as 300 million people because we're just not having enough children to replace us over the long haul. Are the world's resources maybe limited when it comes to food and water, medicine and energy, especially in many countries in Africa? Will we find alternative resources? Well, uh, you know, we can use two different senses of the term limited there. In the one sense, uh, you know, is the earth infinite in size? No, of course not. It is finite in size. But in terms that make an actual difference as to our lives, how we, how we actually practice our living, uh, that sort of limitation is, is irrelevant. What's really relevant is our food resources, our other mineral resources, plants, animals, and the like, our resources limited in terms of our capacity to produce them. Resources are not natural. Resources are man-made. Oil didn't become a resource. It was basically a, a, a mess, a, a nuisance, until people figured out ways to transform it and make it useful. And now we make thousands of different products out of it, very helpful to human life. So resources are not limited in that sense because human creativity, human ingenuity keeps finding ways to make more and more out of less and less. This is our exercise of the image of God in man. God is creative, we're creative too. Some researchers say, Dr. Beisner, that we're losing farmland and that the remaining cropland is deteriorating. What does your research say? Well, the actual long-term trend in terms of farmland is that it's getting to be better and better quality because we're getting better and better methods of farming farmland. Uh, we're, we're abandoning high till methods that lead to a lot of erosion. We are replacing nutrients that we take out of the soil through the use of fertilizers and the like. All of these things are fairly consistent. The reality is that, that we're feeding far more people on far less land because of modern versions of farming. Well, that's great because it leaves more land left over for wildlife, for recreation, for all sorts of other uses. Canada is certainly not overpopulated, but how can countries like where you are in the United States or like China and India sustain their populations? Well, they're doing it very well. Uh, one thing that we have to recognize is that there is no statistical way to define overpopulation. We're told, for example, that Sub-Saharan Africa is overpopulated, but Sub-Saharan Africa's population density is uh, somewhere around 60 people per square mile. You're never told that the Netherlands is overpopulated. Population density there is over 1,300 people per square mile. Why the difference? I have a, a strong hunch that it has to do an awful lot with the color of the skin. The overpopulation movement, the, the anti-population growth movement, really has its roots historically in the eugenics movement of the 19th century that came out of the work of first Thomas Robert Malthus in his essay on the principle of population in 1798, and then the work of, of Charles Darwin in terms of the competition of species for scarce resources, and his uh, cousin, uh, who wrote an, an important early work on eugenics that launched the eugenics movement. Uh, you can't define population, you can't define overpopulation by population density, by population growth rate, by population age distribution, or anything else like that. It all turns, to, it turns out to, to be rooted in people's perceptions of how good life is here or there or another place. Well, you know, Manhattan's highly populated, very densely populated, but it's obviously a place that a lot of people want to live because that reflects in real estate prices there. Now, do we actually have enough room on Earth for about 20 billion people to live on? 
I mean, we're approaching 8 billion now, or maybe should we even consider other planets? Well, uh, I won't touch the other planets issue. I think that's so far off into the future that Yogi Berra would be right, who said that it's really, really dangerous to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, I, I think it's very clear that we have the technology even today, let alone the fact that technology is improving at, an, at a, uh, just an amazing rate, but we have the technology even today to provide very healthful nutrition, housing, medical care, communication, transportation, everything else that people need for a population of 20 billion. But I don't think that we're headed there. It's far more likely that the world's population will peak at, I think, somewhere around, oh, maybe 9 billion, uh, around 2060 to 2070, and then it will begin to decline. And it will continue declining until people start deciding we'd rather have more children, even though it costs a lot to raise them. Some are advocating for abortion as a form of curbing population growth. But what has been the effect of abortion on our economy and national debt? Well, abortion, frankly, has removed millions of people from our populations who otherwise would be productive workers paying taxes, paying into in the United States, into our social security system. And frankly, we've lost hundreds of billions, even trillions of dollars in tax revenues to the American government, likewise in Canada, but on a proportional scale in terms of population, because of abortion. Uh, it's, it's a fabulous way to drive up national debt, especially in terms of social insurance policies, uh, because social insurance consistently depends on current workers to pay the social security payments of retired workers. And if you're not replacing those current workers fast enough, they have a really tough time providing for the retired. Do you think we can actually improve the environment while multiplying resources as the population increases? Well, if history is any teacher at all on this, uh, the answer's got to be yes. We've been improving the environment for a long, long time. Uh, economists of the environment refer to something called the environmental Kuznets curve or the environmental transition. That's the basic principle that in early industrialization, uh, the emission of various different air and water and other pollutants uh, rises significantly. And so you get smog and other such things. But the benefits of the industrial revel uh, activity that emits those things so far outweigh the risks of the pollution that health and longevity, life expectancy, actually rise at the very same time that you've got the increasing pollution. But at various different economic levels, the, the people involved in those communities say, all right, now we can afford the more expensive technology that enables us to reduce those emissions. So what you have is a curve where emissions rise in early industrialization, then they peak, and then they fall. And because of that industrialization, you actually wind up with a cleaner environment than you had before the industrialization began. So any final thoughts on what policies our Western government should change to protect the environment while at the same time boosting the economy? Well, one of the most important policies that they can embrace is simply to, to, to celebrate private property. Uh, you know, it's, it's a real basic thing. You find graffiti on public bathroom walls, but not on your bathroom walls at home, because you have a private property incentive to take care of your bathroom walls at home. What everybody owns, nobody owns, and nobody takes care of. So private property is really a key to both environmental stewardship and economic growth and development. So we should be seeing more privatization of property not less by our governments. That would be, I think, one of the very first things to, to do. Pride in ownership, absolutely. Dr. Calvin Beisner, author of the book, Prospects for Growth, thanks a lot for joining me today on Bridge City News. Well, thank you very much. Glad to be back with you and God bless. On behalf of all of us here at BCN, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and have a great night.